Okay, I uh, guess I should start on track here. Minutes behind. Um, as Grant said, my name is Greg Itzig. I uh, live in Nelson. Um, I work in the uh, Kootenays, including the Kootenay Boundary, for about 35 years. I first came here back in the 1970s, worked for the Forest Service, and covered the whole region, including over here. Spent some time in the Used to be a ranger station in uh, Rock Creek and Grand Forest here. I used to uh, work out of those at, some, at one point as a research scientist. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is climate change and the cookie boundary. Um, wrong one. Okay. So the reason that I'm uh, doing this is I've been working on a couple of projects around climate change in the Kootenays for the last four or five years. Uh, the first one was one that was funded by the Ministry of Forests, or whatever they're called these days, um, looking at uh, uh, vulnerability and resilience assessment for uh, forests in the area. And secondly, for the last couple of years, I've been working on a project that's funded by some environmental NGOs. Uh, wild side of the Cons Conservation Northwest, um, looking at uh, conservation needs in light of climate change, which uh, is actually how Graham and I mapped was a, a workshop that I did earlier this summer in uh, Grand Forks as part of that project. Um, the climate information I'm going to be presenting is not climate information that I've generated or these projects have generated, but it's climate information that comes from a variety of sources. Um, there's a PICIC, the Pacific Climate Impact Consortium out of the University of Victoria, which is mainly funded by the French government. There's Climate WLNA, WNA, which comes out of UBC and the University of Edmonton, and the Climate Impact Group in Washington, which is thinking about their work in the Basin, but also applies to some of this area, as well as from the IPCC, who incidentally will be putting out a new report uh, starting tomorrow, actually, and through for them. Um, I'm going to begin by being clear, and I, I, I never know, speaking to a general audience, kind of what level to start at. So, assuming there are some people who probably don't know too much about climate change, I'm going to start at a fairly low level, and my apologies for those of you who are extremely well informed. But uh, I always think it's good to make sure we know what we're talking about. First of all, I think we need to differentiate the difference between weather and climate. Weather is what happens tomorrow. When you make the decision whether to take your umbrella or your raincoat. And climate is a much more long term thing. This is averages or extremes over a, a significant period of time, usually decades. Um, usually, when we talk about climate, we talk about 30 year averages um, at least. So, today we're going to be talking about climate, not weather. Um, First thing about weather and climate is they're extremely variable. This could be temperature, it could be precipitation year to year. As you know, no two years are never the same. Um, but that variability is contained. And short term variability, usually years or decades, it's uh, usually in our area, it's controlled by ENSO or the uh, El Nino effect, which I'm sure most of you have probably heard of, or La Nina. And they usually last two or three years, five years, that kind of thing. There's also longer term oscillations in climate that are fairly regular. Pacific decadal oscillation, PDO, kind of affects in 10 to 40 year ranges. Uh, we're just moving into a colder phase of that right now, which usually is colder weather for our area. And we also have long term trends, and this is what we're going to be talking about tonight is climate change. This is something that overrides all those other kinds of variability. And when you look at the Columbia Basin, um, there's been quite a bit of change in climate over the past few decades, over the last century. Um, most of you probably know, it was quite a bit warmer in the 1930s. We had a lot of fires, uh, dust cold days out of the prairies, and then it was a bit 
cooler, moister, and over the last 30 years, it's begun to rise again. Um, and you'll notice that it's actually rising at quite a bit steeper level. This is probably the real onset of uh, climate change. And there has been a long-term trend. So what does this mean in terms of climate? When you look out there today, you know, people will say, well, it turns cold, you get a cold winter, wow, well, climate change isn't happening. Um, that's part of that variability, but there's also more happening than that. When you think about climate, Think of that old bell curve you used to hear teachers talk about. You know, you got a few people down there that are failing, you got a people who are really outstanding, but most people are in the middle. So when you get this bell-shaped curve where the average is where most things, and then when you get out toward the edges, there's very few at the very cold and the very hot. This could be years in terms of temperatures. So if climate change is happening, and it's simple, it just means that bell curve shifting the right so we're going to be getting not very many really cold days anymore, so it'll be gone. We'll be getting more hot weather and a few new record hot weather days. But that doesn't seem to be what's happening because we're getting weird. As some people say, climate is just getting weird. We're still getting those really cold days, we're still getting hot days, and it is generally getting warmer. Well, this is uh, looking at European summer temperatures, which we're looking at Europe because they've got data that goes back 500 years. And if you look at this, it is a period that things are moving to the right. The five coldest years that are there are all before 1900. We haven't had any really cold days since then. And the five warmest years have actually all occurred since 2000. So probably the curve has shifted the right. If you notice, the 1970 to 1999 average is actually to the right or warmer than what was the average over the whole uh, 500 years. But that probably doesn't explain everything that's happening. We're also getting all these extremes. We can get still get extremely cold weather or extremely hot weather. So there's another thing that could be changing, and that is the actual shape of the curve itself. In other words, instead of getting most of it being in the middle, the curve is spreading out. We're getting a lot, not only are we getting the majority around the middle, but we're also getting more extremes on, on potentially both ends. In that case, we'll get actually more colder weather, more hot weather, and we'll get record cold and record hot. But we don't seem, as the last graph showed, we're not getting many uh, record cold days. So, Maybe it's more complicated than that, and this is probably more realistically as that's happening, as well as it's getting warmer. And so what we're ending up with is a new climate that is more variable, not hardly any new cold extremes, lots of hot weather, and lots of record hot weather. And that probably is a better explanation of what climate change means. So what it's meaning is, is that we're still going to get some cold days. We're still going to get cold winters. But on average, we're going to get a lot more extreme hot weather. And there actually is some record of that if we look at the northern hemisphere in general. Um, the red graph in the bell curve in the middle is the 1950s, 1951 to 60. And the black line, which you can barely see behind there, is the normal distribution curve attached to that. But if we look at what's happened in the 2000s, for this decade, it's moved to the right, it's gotten warmer, it's a full degree warmer than it was in the 1950s. As well, the bell curve seems to be flattening out and we're getting more extremes. So there actually is some evidence that that's occurring. Now what do I mean by climatic extremes? What it means is extreme weather events. In the heat waves, drought, high intensity rainstorms, windstorms, lightning storms, hailstorms. Um, you had a good windstorm here last year, pretty unusual one. Um, last year in uh, Alberta, they had uh, 12 inches of hail in the middle of July. Now they get hailstorms, but that was a fairly unusual one. And why are these things happening? Well, one of the mechanisms that's theorized, and there seems to be some evidence to, to, uh, to back it up, is that the jet stream, which controls how weather systems move across our continent, particularly in the northern part, 
um, seems to be increasing in amplitude. It's a wave that goes like this, and it's actually going higher and lower on the continent. As well as those waves, as they move across the continent, are moving slower. This seems to be tied to the, the fact that we're melting the ice sheets in the Arctic. But in any case, what it means is, is that these storm systems, they get stalled. Be they highs, which give us the hot, dry weather. So instead of having two or three days of hot, dry weather, we have 10 days of hot, dry weather, which actually brings about a drought. Or in the case of what happened uh, this June, is that you end up with a low, in this case, it's focused right now where Alberta, BC, and Alberta come together, but, and it's locked in place by these two highs, and it stays there for four or five days or a week. And it means that it just keeps raining. And that resulted in the floods that most people are familiar with in Calgary. I can show you another weather map like this that shows what happened in Colorado two weeks ago. The map looks just like this one, except it's moved further south and they had what they consider to be thousand year floods. So there seems to be some evidence that this is occurring. Now that storm in Calgary, those of us in the east and west Kootenays had a real taste of it as well. This is the same storm, June 18th to 21st, which resulted in as much as 140 millimeters of rain in a couple days. Um, in the upper Elk River, Elkford, north of Sparwood, there was millions of dollars of bridges washed out. We're talking long span I-beam bridges that they haven't found. Like they're just gone. Um, same in Beale Creek. There's a bridge you can see right there. That's washed about a half a kilometer downstream. This is uh, and toward the North End Kootenai Lake, Fry Creek created a whole new channel, which hadn't been occupied for almost 100 years. Right, we used to run over here. That channel is completely full now, and it took out about 40 hectares of the forest that dumped it into the lake and created a whole new channel. Same thing happened on Hamill Creek, same thing happened on, on uh, Campbell Creek, all the same storm, as well as Shorter Creek washed out, which is out part of a, um, a trailer park. This is a house on Lower Hamill Creek that was washed away. And Upper Hamlin Creek actually was an interesting one. We've had a couple of fairly major fires there in the last few years, and those actually contributed to landslides, which made the flooding worse in there as well. So you get a combination of extreme events as well. Um, last year at the North End of Kootenai Lake, we had uh, record precipitation for the whole month of June. This is um, 100 years of data from Caswell, and during June, the average rainfall was 60 millimeters. The highest recorded in the previous century was 120. And this year, or last year, we got over 200. In fact, if you add the first couple of days of July, it's 240. So four times the normal amount of rainfall. And most of you are probably aware this resulted in a fairly large landslide, which uh, killed four of my neighbors, destroyed a number of houses. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> creates an ongoing uh, risk. So these extreme events are probably the things that we're most concerned about. There are ongoing things which are more gradual, but it's the increase in extreme events that we need to definitely start planning for. Now, I'm just going to press this point once, but there's a lot of debate right now with the IPCC report coming out as to whether we're causing this or whether global warming is really happening. So this is a, a record of, in the red graph, the con CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere going back 400,000 years and the temperature going back 400,000 years based on ice cores in the Antarctic. This is where we're at today. We're in fact we have the highest level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that has been experienced in Earth in over 2 million years. We are creating a big difference. And it's unprecedented. We can't look back in history and say what's going to happen. We can model and look at the geologic record, but um, it is a big deal. So, how did we go forward from here and suggest what might happen in the future? Well, the IPCC, along with various universities and research units around the world, have developed these global climate models, um, which model all different aspects of things that affect weather and climate. 
And the way they do this is they basically divide the Earth up into pixels, like pixels on your JPEG. And but they have a couple dozen layers of these pixels that go out into the atmosphere. And what the model does is evaluate each of those pixels through time and predicts what's going to happen in the future as we change various aspects of this modeling background, all this input criteria, which includes a whole range of things. We don't have time to go through that kind of thing today, but trust me, they're complicated. Um, and the one thing that they run is different scenarios to what we're going to do about carbon emissions. Um, in this case, the blue line assumes that we stop emitting carbon in the next 30 or 40 years, which, of course, gives you a different outcome than if these lines here indicate we keep doing what we're doing today. And I should point out that this black line is actually what we've been doing, and we're presently above all of the models that they've run. Okay, so anything that comes out of that is actually a fairly conservative estimate of what might happen. It's probably going to be worse unless we change our ways quite quickly. So a number of these different scenarios, making different assumptions about carbon emissions, as well as different models, there's about a dozen different climate models out there. So these 40 different combinations of climate models and different carbon emissions models have been run by, by PKIT for British Columbia. And this actually is what they're projecting for the 2050s. So in other words, what change in precipitation on an annual basis is across the bottom and going up it gets hotter. So down here there's no increase in temperature so the most conservative model suggests by 2050 we might be rising temperature by about a, a degree centigrade and the more pessimistic one suggests it might be three and a half or four degrees increase and the rest of the models are in between. So at this particular point in time, we don't actually know which one is right. We just know that it's probably somewhere in here. So the projects that I've been working on, we first of all examine these ones that are outlined in green. We kind of wanted to get the outside edge of what might happen. Um, we also looked in more detail at three of them, which also are on the outside edge. And I'll present some uh, results from those range of models for that boundary area. So this is just looking at projected changes in temperature by season. Um, you'll notice there's a range for the 2020s. It might go up by 1 or 2 degrees. 2050s, we're looking at anywhere from 1 to 5 degrees. And in the 2080s, we're up to as much as 8 degrees. But what you'll, you'll notice is that almost all the models do agree, although they disagree in the amount of change, the pattern of change is fairly uniform. They're looking at much hotter summers and somewhat warmer or hotter other seasons. And that's, I think, the important take-home message here. We might not know exactly how hot it's going to get, but we know summers are going to get much hotter. They do agree on that. And if we look at precipitation, <coughs> the agreement is even more stark, is that most of them suggest an increase in precipitation in the spring, winter, and fall but they all suggest a decrease in summer precip. Okay, so we got two things going on in the summer that are distinctly different. It's going to be hotter, but not only is it going to be hotter, it's going to be drier. Which I think, living in the boundary, you know what a hot, dry summer is already. So um, that's what the projections are saying. I think the other thing, important thing to point out is that. Um, the variability in terms of temperature um, even by the 2020s were beyond temperatures that we've experienced before. This is the range of, of mean mean temperatures for British Columbia or in the Columbia Basin in the past, and we're already beyond that. And we're well beyond it once we get into 2050s, 2080s. Whereas precipitation is much more variable. And the changes that we're talking about are probably something we may have experienced before, although the summer one may be beyond this is looking at the whole year. 
Um, so one of the ways to try and understand what that means, when I tell you it's going to be two degrees warmer, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around what that might mean. So one of the things we've done is looked at taking those future climates that are projected and saying, well, we know what kind of vegetation grows in a particular climate today. So if we look at the climate that's projected to be here in the boundary in the future, can we find that climate someplace else in North America and look at the vegetation that's there and get an idea of what it will be like to be in that climate in the future. So in British Columbia, we've got this bioinformatic mapping system that we use that, that maps all of these. Yeah, I think most of you are familiar with it. But if we just look here in the Kootenays or in the Mount boundary, we've got the lower elevations, the driest south aspects. We have ponderosa pine, grasslands. Um, when you get over going toward Castlegar, you can see the hemlock or up to Granby. And then in the upper elevation, we have angles to spruce and alpine fir forest and much full pine. And south of us, as you move down into the states or in the Okanagan, we get real grasslands and sagebrush. And I've added those in here because just take a look at that. That is a picture of one of the climates, of what's growing in a climate that's projected for here in the future. So this is just another cross section if we look here to the west of the Kettle Granby. This is the sort of sequence of, of zones that we would expect, and east is, or gets a bit uh, moister and cooler. So what we've actually done is you can actually plot those climates, and this is a, a simple plot, but as soon as you go warmer and drier on the bottom, colder and wetter on top, more coastal up here and more continental over here, <coughs> You could actually locate any particular plot in there. <clears throat> but you can also say if climate change occurs, OK, so that's what the climate is there today. That's what the climate is going to be in the future. And then you go back to the map, as I said, and say, oh, well, that's the vegetation that would grow in there if it had the opportunity in the future. The real issue in British Columbia is, in particular here in the boundary, is that it's going to be getting warmer. So you expect to find the climate that's here somewhere else in British Columbia. It's probably not. It's probably going to go south. It's a lot hotter and drier if you head south. So in this particular case, we've actually used vegetation types from all over Western North America. So we're going to be looking for a climate that fits what's projected for the future. So here's the zones. Vegetation zones that occur in the boundary today, here's uh, Grand Forks down here, the yellow is Ponderosa Pine, the green is uh, Cedar Hemlock type forest, this over here, gold is, is the <coughs> Douglas fir and Montane spruce, and then this purple stuff is the higher elevation of the spruce. So we would locate ourselves about right here. <coughs> So this is the model that's the kind of more optimistic one. It's not going to get that much warmer. We're going to get a slight increase in precip. This is the change of the vegetation types that fit those climates in the future. You'll notice that the England spruce of Alpine fir has completely disappeared, even in this case. It's been replaced by some cedar hemlock. And grasslands have come in, and they basically take up all the way up the um, the cattle, halfway up to Granby, certainly around Christina Lake, and even going over to Castle Guard Trail and up the Arrow Lakes, we're looking at grasslands. These are the ones like I showed in the picture, like sagebrush, like no trees as far as you can see, except for a few cotton with growing trees. Um, if we look at the wetter one, this happens to be the Canadian model actually, but it's a, quite a bit warmer is that grasslands expand even further. And in fact, we lose the cedar hemlock, even though it's wetter. It seems to be the heat is sufficient to overcome moisture, which was a bit surprising to me when I look at the rest of the cookies. It's, it's not really that dramatic. And if we take the hot, dry one, it's basically grasslands almost a big way, or grassland climate, I would say. So these are suggesting some fairly major changes. Now, can say, okay, so this is for the 2080s. This is six, seven decades from now. I and mean, why would we look that far ahead? That's a long way. 
But all the work I've been doing is dealing with forestry. When we plant trees here in the Kootenays and the Kootenay boundary, we're looking at harvesting these trees 100 years from now. So you need to look up that far ahead if you expect to be able to harvest that crop in the rotation time you're talking about. So these are relevant for some of our planning horizons. So just to give an idea, these colored areas on here are where the model had to go to find climates that are projected to be here in the future. Those grasslands, some of them come from down in Washington, but some of them come from as far away as uh, Utah and uh, Nebraska, uh, Colorado. Um, the other way to look at this model is to look at some individual tree species. We can look at ponderosa pine. So this left one is where ponderosa pine grows today, and this is projecting where it might grow in the future. You'll notice that even by the 2020s, it's potentially growing more areas, but it's not that common. Frequency is, is low. And this is based on an average of 18 models. So what this last graph shows is whether the models agree or not. So if it's red, all 18 models agree on those pine won't grow there. If it's dark blue, they all agree it does. And the colors in between, some models say yes, some models say no. If you look into the 2050s, it expands even further, but the models are less certain. And by the 2080s, it's pretty well all the models are agreeing that it's disappeared from the lower valley bottom, which again backs up that theory that we're going to much hotter, drier grasslands. And this is, again, 18 models scenario. We look at Engelman spruce, it's the opposite. It um, begins to, it's fairly common at the upper elevations today by the 2020s. It's looking more scarce. 2050s, 2080s, the climates for England spruce are pretty well disappeared. Um, the other thing we looked at in the study in the West Kootenays was we looked at fire. Obviously, these harder drier summers got us thinking that, well, maybe fire is going to be an issue. And secondly, if these trees are going to disappear, how are they going to disappear? Are they just going to die in place, or is there something else going to lead to these, these changes? And I think the servants is certainly one. Fires are very uh, sporadic, and we've had a lot less fires in the last 30 or 40 years than previously. Um, we actually look back. This is a map of all the fires that have occurred since 1918 in the West Coast East. Um, and we then correlated that with climates back then and used that to project the climates in the future and say, well, how much fire would we expect to see? So these are looking at three different parts of the West Kootenays. This is the average for the previous century or the previous 90 years. Quite a few more fires, 20s to 50s, that point of top drive in the 1930s. It's been pretty steady since the 1940s. 2020s, it's going to go up. By the 2050s, it's going to go up a lot. Um, the other thing that's going to affect things are insects and diseases. We've already experienced Mountain Pine Beetle, the largest devastation in the history of Canada, actually. Um, that was probably tied to climate change. We're not getting those cold winters that kill the beetles. You've certainly had some experience of that here in the boundary. Um, but there's lots of other beetles out there, too. There's other things like spruce fiber, which is affecting the spur here, Dothostroma, which is where it's moist root disease, just loves these drought conditions. Probably wondering about this woman here. Um, when you do a Google search on spruce beetles, she always comes up, because she had an outside wedding and she got a spruce beetle out of her dress. <laughs> So there's other hazards out there. <laughs> um, so the other thing is, is we, I've been talking about these climates shifting and, and things and vegetation shifting. Well, the simple thing was that things just moved like that. It's probably not going to happen that way. Each tree has a slightly different tolerance, and these ecosystems are going to disaggregate. And you're going to get new things coming in. 
including insects and disease. So it's going to be much more difficult to predict what things are going to look like. Um, I'm sure you're very interested in water. There's been some uh, modeling done, particularly in the states, looking at all the Columbia Basin, of course, because they're very interested in how much water we're going to be supplying them, given that conditions are going to get hotter and drier south of the border as well. Um, this is some modeling that's been done for the kettle, and it's based on modeling of how much flow the Kettle River has just as it crosses the border. Um, <coughs> Basically, what it's saying is first set of graphs is snow water equivalent. In other words, how much water is contained in snow on, uh, at any given time. And of course, in the summer, it's zero, but it used to be this blue line was the amount that has occurred over the last 30 years. The red line is the mean of 10 models projecting into the future. And you'll notice by the 2080s, it's about half. Um, this is going to change the flow in the river substantially. We're going to get more, more flow in the winter months because, of course, there's going to be less snow. The lower elevation probably aren't going to have any snow, so it's what used to come as snow will come as rain. and will run off immediately. Flooding will be diminished because the peak will be less because there's less snow to melt. But on the other hand, in the fall, because there wasn't any snow to melt, flows are going to be quite substantially reduced in uh, the latter months of the year is, is what the models are <laughs> So just to kind of sum this up, <clears throat> we've got human activities which are creating climate change, but at the same time, our other activities are affecting ecosystems out there as well. We're logging, we're mining, we're building roads. So ecosystems are under a fair bit of stress from what we're doing already, and we're adding to this with climate change. But there are all these intermediary processes that are also going to be changed with climate change. And these are probably going to have more effect, things like fire, insects, um, wind, wind storms, seas. And this is going to make changes to our ecosystems. Probably some of them may be lucky enough to migrate, some may reorganize, some will become extinct. And that's going to have an effect on us because we depend on those ecosystems for ecosystem services, for resources, as well they affect us through natural hazards. And we can respond to that in a number of ways. Uh, one is adaptation, which we're going to talk about tonight, is basically trying to live with these changes. But as you see, the changes that are coming down the pipe are probably not going to be ones that we want to live with. The other option is what we call mitigation, which is to actually try and do something about climate change, which I think we cannot forget. So I was asked to uh, look at one aspect here and talk about some uh, challenges and some opportunities. So I was going to talk about forestry ecosystems. Pick, so to pick three challenges, which I think are important. One is obviously going to be fire. It's certainly going to be increasing intensity. <laughs> Changing habitats and consequent species loss. We're going to be losing species. There's no question about it. There's some species that are not going to survive. And lastly, reforestation is going to be an issue, not only because of what's projected out there in 2080, but the important thing is, is that what might grow there in 2080 won't grow there today. So what do we plant? We've got to change the way we look at forestry. And it's not going to be simple. Some opportunities. Um, there's certainly room for some harvesting and silviculture treatments to try and build resilience into our stands and try and make them more uh, resilient to fire, more resilient to insects and trees could be using wood waste to replace fossil fuels, which gives us sort of a mitigation and a um, adaptation at the same time. Increased risk of grassland habitats will be good for ranching. Um, and I was also supposed to give an example of something. This is a, a program that goes on just south of the line called Fuels for Schools. You can uh, Google it. Uh, some of you have maybe heard of it. It's a great program where they're actually giving schools low interest loans to convert their oil burning and natural gas burning burners to wood burning burners and then getting them to sign a long term contract to use wood waste which normally we would just burn up in the bush to get rid of to reduce slash hazard and they're using it to heat their schools and so it provides funding to do the fire interface fire treatments and to create more resilient stands that at the same time the schools win because it's a lot cheaper than buying oil and natural gas. 
Um, what can we do in general? Well, there's obviously lots of things we'll talk about tonight in terms of adaptation. Um, this is more focused on forestry. I think the one thing to really begin to do is, contrary to where the federal and provincial governments are going, research is way more important now than it ever was before. Because there's going to be a lot of surprises out there. And the federal government seems to be bent on doing away with scientists and science. Um, this is the time we need them more than we've ever needed them before. Um, mitigation, there's really only one answer. We need to stop burning fossil fuels. We should just leave our cars parked here and walk home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we've got to begin to think about those kinds of things. And lastly, I think this is something to think about tonight in this discussion, is to try and look for win-wins, things that will help us adapt and at the same time reduce our carbon footprint. Those are the ones we really need to look at. So, here we go. Anybody in the room? Thanks so much, Greg. That was great. Like, you gave me so much food for thought, and, and if I have stolen some of my thunder quite happily, too. So I'm just going to transition to my slides and we'll start talking about water. Okay. 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 You know, the rate, the rate Canada is shipping out and coal will be well, all That was a lovely dinner. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate that. And now with all that sugar in my mouth from the dessert, I'll try and speak. Um, honey, thank you, honey. Oh, even better. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is some of the aspects of climate change and adaptation, resilience, and mitigation to do with water, and water in the boundary being, of course, the Kettle River and its tributaries. Now, I, I, I'm doing a little bit of work on that. I'm going to coordinate the Kettle River Watershed Management Plan with the Regional District of Puget Boundary, um, who is hosting this event. And I thought this was actually going to be a great opportunity to see it as being a good opportunity to bring together interest in water with other aspects of interest across the region. People care about the future. We want to think about what we need to do and how to do, how to do it differently. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our watershed, what might happen, and, and a couple of ideas of what we can do. Now, Greg mentioned that we, we I asked him to uh, speak to some challenges and some opportunities. One role that the five of us have to make are, are as provocateurs, basically, get you thinking and discussing. Some of what I say might be controversial, or it might provoke arguments about what to do. And that's a really good thing, because there's so much uncertainty. And as Greg said, we really need to rethink how we're doing what we're doing in order to move in the future. So that, uh, that said, these are some values and uses of water that people in the boundary spoke to me about in a, a survey that we held last fall. And really, this gives us kind of a groundswell of support for thinking about how we plan for water in the future. These are the things that people care about. So there's a big survey online, but just kind of even jump, start to jump to some of the some of the issues in there, how they connect together, and wow, you see how important water is in everything that people people do. And several hundred responses, and, and that really set the tone. So there's a, a whole bunch of impacts in the region. Um, most of these images I stole from Wikipedia, so uh, they're, they're open source. I'm not going to cite them other than that. But um, you see the pot on the stove, of course, um, the increased uh, evaporation potential, the increased warmth with less precipitation. There's greater plant stress, there's greater fire risk, and, and moisture deficit, that drought that we start to see with the short term or longer term coming out. There's changes to the vegetation and runoff and groundwater infiltration. There's less snow accumulation and faster snow melt, which means that overall higher river flows maybe earlier in the spring and much lower river flows later on in the summer. Getting on to, uh, there's a historical picture of 1684 a drought, uh, a flood in, in Germany 
Um, we, we, look, we looked at some of the flooding situations recently, recently as we got the highest. Just because there's less rain in the summer generally doesn't mean we might we not get way more in that 500 or 1,000 year flood, which contrary to what people, some, some people think doesn't happen every 500 or 1,000 years, it might happen two years in a row or every 10 years in the new normal. It's, it's, we've lost the predictability. <laughs> And there's going to be a, a much greater, of course, irrigation demand, and this is going to change a lot of how the surface water flows from those altered landscapes on the surface into the groundwater and out to our rivers. So how we use water from our aquifers and from our rivers as we use more of it will also really impact what's left in the rivers. So some of the, the, the challenges, uh, Greg mentioned that you know, the landslides and the erosion that happened with those big floods, we can start to expect more of those. Once you add in a few fires and then a few extreme rain events or rain on snow events in the winter, your, your, uh, you know, your geomorphology, your movements of slopes and rivers starts to, starts to shake up a little bit. Uh, I don't know if any of you have traveled near Midway recently, just uh, west of Midway, there's a large one, uh, one kilometer section of the Kettle River that's been cut off by some fairly recent uh, flood activity that's basically cut off a whole big oxbow and carved right through the farmer's field. So do we start to expect to see these more where we have oxbow forming in our valleys? How do we plan for floodplains? Those are some of the things that I, I worry about. And of course, a lot of people love fishing in our region. And the increased temperature, lower flows, this is really tough on our rainbow trout, white fish, and other sport fish that are already kind of out of threshold. So how are they going to do in this, in this future? So with the increased demand for water, with less certain supply, I think a big, big movement forward is how do we increase the awareness and the ability to conserve water? Right? So that's kind of the big direction that we start to move. And um, one thing, I was actually talking with someone in BC Agriculture the other day who was talking about the impact of, of, of you know, small center pivot irrigation. Um, instead of the line irrigation. And you can have 15 to 20 percent savings with this different type of irrigation. And that's about the same amount of less rain in the summer that some of the models predict. So you say, you know, we can get partway there with some technical fixes like irrigation. Let's really start promoting that irrigation. And in areas where it's maybe marginal to do that, try out different crops that don't need as much water. Um, start thinking differently about the business in those spots. So that's one opportunity to think about. Another one, um, water capture, storage, and reuse. Uh, just in a, in, a, in a garden shed in your backyard, if you capture the rain off of that, our typical June storms give us enough water to water your raised beds for the following couple of months quite often. Depends on the year, but if you have bigger storage, string a few of them together, you might have adequate supply at home and garden scale to get really far. Even more promising is something that's not currently promoted because of health codes and that kind of thing, but um, uh, the great water reuse from households and businesses. How can that be uh, reused within our homes and landscapes instead of um, treated and put into the river? So two opportunities to do with water conservation. The other one has to do with floods and, you know, we said flood fire famine, so I have to speak to that. Um, changes in the frequency and severity of landscape, landslides, floods, and river erosion. What, what do we see in the future there? So this is a big, challenging topic. How do we increase the resilience of shorelines and floodplains through community-based planning? Because it really needs to be a community-wide effort. So one of them that really makes sense is natural vegetation is really good at regenerating itself after, you know, after flows. And you know, quite often when slopes along the river start to slip, we, we jump right into doing riprap, and that is one solution, armoring the banks. But really, if we step back a little bit further from the water and protect the vegetation and make sure we're not building our homes and structures so close, we're at that much less at risk. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of a, a really soft approach, especially it takes some time to bring in, but it's, it's, it's going to be a big community discussion to look at how we step back a little bit from the water. And perhaps more, maybe before June, this would have been a little bit more controversial, but I remember shortly after the floods in Alberta, Calgary and Alberta realized, okay, those most hazardous places, you're not going to get insurance if you go back there. We're going to buy you out. 
you know, from, from moving back into those spots. So one of the areas of great hazard in the landscape where not only do we need to control development, but maybe we actually need to have more resilient landscapes that farms might still need completely adequate, maybe restoring bug lanes to marshes and optical <coughs> wetlands is what's needed there. Some you remember this. This isn't something you take on overnight. This is maybe a 50-year, 100-year kind of thing. We'll know more about these hazards as we go on. But that one flood event that takes out part of Johnson's Landing could be next year or the year after. We don't know. So we start identifying these areas, updating our floodplain maps, and looking to how we might really avoid the greatest losses that can occur in the spots. So this is just a quote from uh, someone who's working on this topic for the Rockefeller Foundation. And they're working on this in a big way. They're trying to get 100 cities across Asia to work on resilience in a, in a huge way. So they're putting a lot of money into it. So I, I just love the quote that we are sharing one atmosphere. And we have that shared responsibility, not only for our own backyard, but for across the world, to reduce to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change, and also support efforts to help our vulnerable communities adapt to and build resilience to the effects of climate change. So that's the challenge for tonight. When we move into our discussions, we'll pick up some of those opportunities, look at the pros and cons, and uh, see where we get from there. So next, I think that's, that's, that's about all I have. Um, next, I'd like to move to Wally. Wally Russell, come on up. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for uh, giving us the chance to have a little bit of a good time. Thanks to the organizers, to Grace and Graham, especially. They've done a lot of work. I don't like microphones. <laughs> You're not the only one. Uh, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, <laughs> about. Uh, Six, seven years ago, really, so I grew up in Grand Forks, and then I moved away, and then I came back. And when, shortly after I came back, one of the, the food producers who actually grew part of your food tonight said to me, he said, well, with climate change, you're going to be able to grow more, aren't I? And uh, my response uh, was basically, uh, I think Greg mentioned it already, he said, trust me, it's complicated. <laughs> and this, this, is, this is actually one of my main points that I want to convey tonight, which is that trust me, it's complicated. Uh, and this is essentially what we're trying to do, is we're trying to figure out what is the role of climate change on growing food that we want to eat, all right? It seems like a very simple system. This is a bean, this is a 100-year-old heritage ducobor bean that uh, J.J. Berrigan's uh, uh, mom gave me this last year. That's my daughter. So how does this system work? Oh. My animation didn't, didn't work out. Oh. So just pretend you can't see all these pieces. <laughs> you animate it. Yeah. So the temperature piece is obvious. Temperature increases. If that's true, and that's really all we're talking about is a couple degrees of temperature, then yeah, this bean is going to grow a little faster. We might actually get more food to eat. But then once we start putting those into these models, we see, OK, food production might actually go up. And then all of a sudden we think, oh, well, CO2 is, is part of this driving kind of cocktail of, of things as well. And that's good for plants too, right? So, so that's going to make them grow better as well. So if we have a model and we're just putting those two pieces in, things are going even better for a lot of these crops, all right? These simple models, they're looking at, at one, one plant, for example, and looking at individual inputs and how those respond. And then we start looking at rainfall, and then the tides start to turn a little. As Greg mentioned, all of those different models are predicting less rainfall in the middle of the summer. Well, that's not so good for our crops. And on top of that, they're predicting uh, unpredictable rainfall. So all of a sudden, you have a flood in the spring, and three days of water on this little bean plant means it's going to die. At the same time, uh, we see, then we start putting in more than that, that one plant, one person model, and we see pests, and we start to look at how those dynamics change as temperature changes and as climate changes. And then on top of those pests, we start to look at the diseases that are potentially transported with those pests 
and how those as well are responding to this. And that model of a sudden becomes very, very complicated. This, uh, this is, anybody know what this is called? No, it's littler. It's called a, a glassy wing sharpshooter. So I just like the name and I figured I better get a picture of something. No, it's actually in California, this is becoming a huge problem because this, this is a, a, like a leaf hopper, okay? But it moves around and it transfers a, a pathogen to plants when it moves around. And this little, this little leaf hopper is much more receptive to a little bit warmer temperatures than its, its parasite. Okay, so there's things that there are other animals that, that parasitize this, and it doesn't respond. It responds faster. So all of a sudden, grape producers and uh, 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 I think, uh, nectarine producers are having all these problems with pathog pathogens that are being circulated more rapidly because of climate change, because of this little insect. All right. So now coming back to this model of, of one plant and one person, we change those into little balls and sticks. As a scientist, we like little balls and stick models. <laughs> this, is, this is more representative of what we're actually looking at. Not one ball and one stick, but all this. Okay, This is a, a, a model that uh, I was working on with colleagues for a, different, a, a totally different system. Same thing applies. Each one of these balls is a plant down on the bottom. Each of these other balls are things that are eat, eat plants. As soon as you start pulling on those balls in the middle of that, that network, it is really, really difficult to predict how that system is going to respond. Okay? So this is uh, uh, Icarus. And probably a lot of you know the story of Icarus and Daedalus. Daedalus is the, uh, the, the engineer, basically, that, that crafted all sorts of magnificent things in Crete. And uh, this is his son. He made these, these wings, told his son he wasn't allowed to fly too close to the sun. Yeah, he, he didn't listen, so he got into trouble. But this, I use this as, a, as an indicator of hubris. So this idea that we can really understand these systems well enough to, to uh, I didn't want that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, to, to to predict very easily what's going on. Anybody that shows you those simple models and says that's a good indicator of what is going to go on, is full of hubris, and it's not going to work out that way. We maybe don't know, and we maybe have some agreement, but it's not going to work that way. Uh, Graham asked me to identify a challenge and some opportunities. Here's the challenge, uh, stated by a, a, a colleague that I was on a panel with last year. He said, feeding 9 billion people in a truly sustainable way will be one of the greatest challenges of our civilization has had to confront. It will require the imagination, determination, and hard work of countless people from all over the world. There is no time to lose. And that's it. And you can replace the 9 billion, because that's the forecast for a few years down the road when we're going to run into a lot of trouble. You can replace that with 3,000 for my little electoral area. You can replace it for 10,000 for this kind of general community. Wherever you draw those lines, the same challenge applies. Is how are we going to feed those people in a truly sustainable way? And here, no, so this. This is a, a way to represent a bunch of different data. Look at the bottom one first, and, and you can see so each one of these little wings on this on this flower represents uh, of here would represent uh, the goal of what we're trying to attain. So these things are how much food we're producing. This is uh, access, food security, access, and and, uh, and uh, security of that food. This is the environmental impact, things like Graham was talking about water pollution, quality, quantity kind of things, and then uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Lab. So this is what we're going for. This is what it looks like right now. So this is based on data. Okay? This, is, this is real data. And that's where we are. We have a huge environmental impact, and we're not producing as much food as we need or as we ought to need. Okay? So I'm going to condense that down into a little bit simpler thing. So here's our, our three bins. How are we doing in those three bins? Okay. Food production. I pulled a lot of census data before I did this talk, looking at, at the, the actual distribution of who's growing food, as opposed to other things around in this area. We have a tiny amount of food production relative to everything else. We grow a lot of hay. We don't grow a lot of uh, cereal, grains, so on and so forth. Food access. We know there's all sorts of complications there. It's, it's hard to put on this meal for you with local. Environmental damage. We're doing okay, but 
we need to be able to rein that in, and with the unpredictability in the future, it's going to get harder. Ignore these two, because in my animation, they haven't popped up yet either. <laughs> Here are my opportunities, okay? Here are my three opportunities. Number one, practice it, okay? Uh, so we know we have to grow food. That's obviously part of, part of what we're going to be able to accomplish. Crop diversification, all right? That's the one that I want to put forward tonight as something worthy of conversation, and how do we figure out how to attain it, all right? Uh, we do a much better job than the Midwest already, for example, and that's where a lot of these recommendations come from, is those large monoculture kind of systems, which is what we slowly trundle on towards to. Uh, buffer zones and woodlands, in, in terms of being reservoirs for the, the parasites of that glassy wing sharpshooter and so on, so that we can control those pests and water use, those kind of practice-based things, policy things. I'm in the midst of a, an OCT review in my area. There's frankly low uh, public engagement in that process, right? And there's all sorts of really fascinating tools out there to really get engaged so that we can produce policy that enables resilient food systems, all right? And we need to figure out, we need to get the engagement to make it happen. And discourse, that idea of educating both our farmers and the public about things to do, how to grow those dry land crops that are grown in Rock Creek already to actually feed people from those lands and make money at the same time. Facilitating informed discussions. At, uh, uh, there's a, a, a Jim, Jim Hogan, I think his name, talks about this idea of, of desmogging the public square. So that idea of, of Greg saying, Trust me, I'm complicated. Or trust me, it's complicated. <laughs> right. uh, in terms of actually figuring out how, what do we do with that? So when he showed you a bunch of predictions from uh, probably on the order of 50 to 100 different models that were produced by different scientists, and they all kind of converge on something. At UBCM, at, that, at, the, at the, UB, the, the Union of BC Municipalities, we had a resolution on the table about genetically engineered uh, organisms. That debate was all over the board, and there was absolutely no way to tell if anybody was telling the truth. All right? Exactly. There's no scatter that centers on some point in that conversation. Because in that, in that realm, there's no value placed on who is actually telling the truth. And we have to figure out some way so that people still re remain engaged in that process because they recognize that there is some value in that truth. Yeah. And I don't have to explain it again. Uh, the reason that diversification matters is because it's going to, it increases our food production to some degree, it's borderline, it's not going to do a, a great deal of increasing this production point, but it means that things like the non-organic producers that are using agrochemical inputs can use those inputs to tune that system instead of to drive that system. In a, in a monoculture system, you need those chemicals to drive the production of that system. A diversif diversified processing system means that you use that much more, much more uh, tenderly. Uh, and this is again just talk I, I wanted to talk about that enabling policy piece. And uh, she's smart. This is my daughter, and I was using her as an example. When she starts talking, you have no idea whether she's telling you a story that has any substance to it or not. But she does like her uh, one. That's it. Thank you. You're rolling that really good conversation along. <laughs> All right, next up is Ryan Durant, and we're talking a little bit more about ecosystems. Okay. All right, thank you, Graham and Grace, for inviting me. This is a very interesting evening for me. Um, as my mother just said two seconds ago, everyone's already said everything. So, <laughs> it's good that my presentation is absolutely no more words than the, the title of my name and it's nice and simple. Um, my real interest is ecosystem specifically plants, and I guess by extension biodiversity in that. And we've talked a fair bit in that. I hate to say, I'm sorry. We've talked a fair bit tonight about the changes, anticipated changes, potential changes, variability, and really the, the unknowns associated with climate change and where it's all going. And Roland just gave us really nice examples of how a lot of that leads into agriculture. 
And one that jumped out at me at the agriculture is really looking at things like diversity and natural predators and that whole side of it. And that leads perfectly into my passion, really, which is figuring out where things are, what they are, and what their function is in the landscape. Um, so ecosystems is a huge topic. We could go in many different ways with it. But I guess the, what I'm really interested in is really just present and get right to it, presenting a case study of the kind of work I've been doing and really an applied tool in what we can do somewhere in between Greg's presentation and Roy's presentation, more of the regional, sort of a landscape level of how can we look at what is here, how can we look at what the, the value of it, the ecosystem values is, what is this area providing for us, and then by extension from that, how can we look at the landscape and do some kind of plan to figure out where it's going and what we want to do in the landscape. So I have a quick and simple local case study. So the last two or three years now in the Skullcannon Valley, we've been doing a whole bunch of work. We started out by doing a whole bunch of fish inventories and population settings and stuff, and moved on last year doing something called sensitive ecosystems inventories, so looking at more of a landscape level of the various ecosystems. And it's going to progress on from there this year. So this is my case study to wrap around ecosystems. So Skullcannon Valley. Goes all the way basically from the junction of the Kootenai River right up to Silicon Lake is our very randomized study area. And so what we've been doing is getting really nice imagery. We've been getting out there, we've been actually mapping it. So we've been on the ground mapping it out and really at a local learning level, learning what we have. Because if we want to do any kind of planning for the future, any kind of resiliency, we really need to know what we have. And this is a place where there's a huge passion for any kind of environmental aid with ecology for a long time that literally no one's ever taken the time to actually get out there and really map it and see what's there. We simply have no idea. And once you actually get on the ground, it's amazing how, not amazing, how interesting, amazing how bad some of it is and how good some of it is. And even in a place like the Silicon Valley, you drive through and go, oh, it's green, it looks beautiful. When you actually start looking at it from a sort of functioning perspective, you realize how hammered most of it really is. We've been talking the last week a lot about wetlands, Silicon Valley, and I've actually been unable to find a really good wetland in Silicon Valley yet that it's actually functioning really good. It's in really good shape. A lot of them are already looking really bad human influence from a variety of different factors. And if we start adding climate change on top of that, who knows where it's really good to go. So this is me jumping right into opportunities and challenges at exactly the same time, not really to find them. But my opportunity is the opportunity to actually have the time to get on the land and at a local level, whichever your area is really learn what is there and come up with some kind of a tool to describe what's there so you can look at it over time and really help your planning processes. My challenge is actually getting planning to do that and actually doing it for real and doing it in a meaningful way where you can actually learn what the pieces are in a meaningful way where you can actually use it in some kind of planning process. And after watching Greg's presentation, it kind of destroys a lot of my thought process on it because <laughs> I was all excited earlier today and we were having a conversation about looking at habitat values for rare species and landscape level linkages and everything else and doing this planning stuff in the valley over the long term. And then when I saw his map of what it's going to look like in 20 or 40 years, I go, oh, well, <laughs> that's great now, but in the, real, in the end, it might be good, it might not. But since we're putting effort into trying to preserve what is there, to restore what is there, and really understand what we have to begin with, I think we can be a lot farther ahead a lot of other areas that literally don't know what's there. Like, you know, I grew up in Christina Lake, and there's a lot of areas around here I don't even know. So, so what we do is we map these things out. We give them all kinds of fancy codes to describe what's there. We can theme them in all different kinds of ways and say these are light components of an ecosystem type. These ones are marshes, these ones are forests, these ones are floodplains, these are rivers. These areas are really degraded, natural valleys. And then we can really start to build theme maps to put functions and conditions and all kinds of assessments on it. Our big one is really trying to figure out how we go beyond just saying this is a forest and wetland, but how we actually assess it and go, this one actually is functioning. These ones are where we actually should put effort into in restoration. And these ones are where we actually should put pretty effort into conservation, actually buying, purchasing, protecting otherwise, to make kind of big linkages. So it's not as directly related to climate change as the other one, but in a place like Grand Forks or in the boundary in general, we have something like the Kettle River, where again, everybody has all the little favorite spots. They know a lot of localized values. But does anybody have a really good picture of the entire system of what's there? 
of where the actual the bed, the prime pound head is, where all the really degraded sites are that really could use a hand, and where all the areas are that in the future are really going to be our biological refuges, our hot spots of diversity that when climate change does hit, we want to make sure those are maintained, not developed or destroyed now, and are really intact as possible in the future, so they are really a refuge of what species we may have left. So like an example of the map, and in the end you get all kinds of crazy, pretty pictures with a million colors that you can't make any sense of. <laughs> and that's the challenge, is actually collecting all this plethora of data and actually using it in some meaningful way to come to the goals of talking tonight. So I guess if I was sitting down with the group tonight, that'd be my real challenge is we all have different interests. We all have access or are in the midst of collecting different kinds of data, where it's, whether it's ecosystem stuff like myself or it's social or economic or anything else. But in this age of being completely overwhelmed in data and just pounded with volume of data, how can we actually use it somewhat effectively to get some of it? Because I see it's one of my biggest problems. That's it. the opportunity to talk about what I just love to talk about all the time. So this is a really, uh, <laughs> it's good for me there. <laughs> and my perspective is quite different from the other speakers tonight. Uh, I hope you'll find it to be uh, challenging and useful. And um, uh, I'm going to be just racing through a whole bunch of things and uh, not getting to the down, down and looking at critical analysis at all, but just trying to look at how we can inspire ourselves to move forward. So um, what I want to say is that the human contribution to climate change is, in my view, driven by an overwhelming thirst for extreme power, extreme wealth, and extreme Western lifestyle. <clears throat> and we have our dominant economy based upon continual growth, uh, as you can see, is uh, doing itself in. Um, and it leads to uh, profits for a few and um, all kinds of uh, climate impacts and social impacts. And I won't go into a detail there because I want to spend time on other things, but I have lots of details if anybody would like to hear them. <clears throat> so um, who here besides me feels huh, scared <laughs> in the face of all of this? Um, we're facing a consolidation of power, a broken democratic system, and this can lead to feelings of cynicism and powerlessness. And people can say, ah, oh, heck, we can't do anything, so forget about it. So as all the bad stuff can happen in 80 years, well, check with it. However, some of us have grandkids and we can't do that. So I believe that citizens can regain power. And uh, we are seeing um, lots of people around the world getting involved in trying to reform the system through cultural and behavioral change, policy change, economic change. So um, reform at the grassroots, um, things like corporate social responsibility movement, socially responsible investment movement, the rise of the cooperative movement, the rise of the community economic development movement, the rise of the social enterprise movement, these are things I think that are moving around looking at reforming our existing economy. Uh, however, uh, for me, I'm more interested in where we look at change, where we can start looking at a steady state economy rather than a, a continual growth economy. <clears throat> so I'm going to spend some time <clears throat> telling you about some of uh, the projects I've had the uh, opportunity to work with and uh, in hope that we can be inspired rather than feeling uh, hopeless. 
And so I just want to say, yeah, you know, we can do stuff. I really believe that. So, um, I'll begin with one example that my partner Frank Orland over there and I experienced. Um, and I want to start out with this because I think it's important that we pat ourselves on the back when we actually move ahead with something that we really want to do. So we were concerned that the um, food system on Vancouver Island was in the state of collapse and again, a tremendous amount of hay being grown there. I don't know quite how we're all going to do it with, with hay. I think it won't work. So uh, what we thought was um, we needed to uh, find some way to increase the, the potential for farmers to make some money and get them a really good sustainable market. And we figured that really all the institutions on the island should be buying local food. And of course, uh, they weren't. So we managed to do a community-based um, research project. We went about it through research. And um, we um, found out that the kinds of concerns that the institutions had were concerns that actually could be addressed, that they had never thought they could be addressed. They were pretty stuck with the situation they were facing. They really felt that NAFTA was going to close them down and they really couldn't do anything local because they would, it would be against the law. So we did some legal research and found out, in fact, we could get around NAFTA. Uh, we also found they were very fearful about change and didn't really want to change their practices. But um, we uh, found through a very interesting process that I can't go into right now, a hero, uh, the purchaser at the University of Victoria, and um, we were able to win them over. Frank actually brought forward the carbon argument. The university was paying an awful lot of money for carbon um, for, because of carbon. And we were able to show them how they could account for their carbon and um, they could actually uh, reduce their carbon uh, check by doing a, bit job, a better job on their uh, local food system. So the, the strategy ended up that they broke up their RFPs, made specific carbon related purchasing criteria. And the result is now that uh, UVIC, 20 of the UVIC's 24 food suppliers are Vancouver Island based. 100% of their baked goods are made on Vancouver Island. Half of the veggies are moving up every year. Uh, chicken, eggs, and wild salmon are pretty well 100%. They're favoring organic and fair trade. They've had tracked carbon reductions and savings. Uh, the, now the whole purchasing department for all their millions and millions of dollars of purchasing is based upon the four bottom line criteria, people, planet, profit, what's the other one? Culture. And uh, they've won major awards from their peers and the students love them and they have now got a whole thing about local food going on at, at the university. It's really quite exciting. <coughs> So there are many groups and people who take on things like this around the world and uh, in my view it's, it, we do this because it's, uh, we have to do it in our uh, own defense. And if you want to know more about this particular slide, Brian can tell you all about it because he developed the Vancouver Island Pizza. Anyway, I'm particularly inspired by the cooperative movement, by the CBD movement, the social enterprise movement and we're provided examples. Uh, all these are models in our own hands. We can grab hold of these. Um, and so I want to give you a few examples. I have. I could do this for all day with all these examples. Uh, but some of the things that I've actually had something to do with one way or another. So I'd like to talk to you about the Soup Nation. It's a little group on, on Vancouver Island. They have 250 people. They went through a planning process for two years with a community developer a friend of mine. And now they have the largest photovoltaic project in Canada, producing 75% reduction in their power use. Their youth are being trained as solar technologists. And people are coming from all over the world to see what they're doing. The First Nations are, very, uh, are coming in droves. One of their major economic drivers is now receiving people and telling them their story. They're now in the process of building a great big huge commercial greenhouse solar powered because they want to feed themselves. They want to become like their ancestors and look after themselves and into the future. I don't know much about this one but I'm interested in it and that's a Kimberly Sun Mine. Uh, they decided that in their sustainability plan that they wanted to become self-sufficient. 
The Sun, Man, the Sun Mine is intended to be the first on-grid large solar plant in BC and the largest solar power plant in Western Canada. I'd like to know more about this one. I'm also very interested in cooperative models. Mountain Equipment Co-op was started in 1970 by four students. There are now 3.5 million members and 300 million members in, uh, in annual sales, and they have a strong conservation and climate change record. And I want to move on to some of something in the wrong direction. I had your same problem there. Can I move back somehow? You can scroll up in the school. Scroll up. Yeah. I want to talk for a few minutes about Mondragon. Who here has heard of Mondragon? Good, I'm glad. Some of them have heard about Mondragon for me, I know. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is a model that we could actually replicate, but I really think it's important to look at it. If you look in the top right hand corner there, does that look familiar? Kind of looks like, you know, our little mountains. Yes. Anyway, that was uh, the picture in 1956 when they got started. There's the five guys that got this whole thing going. This is a picture of them uh, recently. Mondragon is a linked cooperative model in Spain. I've had the benefit of going there. It's quite a stunning experience. Um, they have uh, this linked system of 250 co-ops. They have 84,000 worker members. They are the major contributor to their economy, which when they started out 60 years ago or so was completely in, in total dysfunction. Uh, another really good linked co-op model that I'm, I'm really interested in is in northern Italy in the Emilia Romagna district. Have anybody heard about the Emilia Romagna district? That's where Parmesan cheese comes from. Uh, this is northern Italy that after the Second World War was in complete disarray. They now are the richest part of, um, of Italy. And they have um, a cooperative network for um, of small businesses and cooperatives based upon a real interesting cooperative hub. Uh, and they have more than 200,000 people involved in their system. It again is a major part of the economy in their region. <clears throat> so the critical ingredients coming from these examples for me are uh, the fact that all of the examples were driven by some kind of desperation or panic or visionary leadership, or ideological passion. There was also another very key piece, and that's there was a presence of an organizer who knew how to do something around this kind of cooperative system, who knew how to build value chains. And often, often the people who played this role were priests and ministers, people who could spend their whole time and were supported by the community to do that, so that they could help organize the folks. And the other extremely important piece is the fact that the community people themselves need to invest. They need skin in. We can't wait around for grants. We can't wait around for the government to solve the problems. We, we, these models, these models in Mondragon, everybody invests a large proportion of their, of their salary into the general fund. That's how they finance themselves. The same thing in the, the Italian model. And I'd just like to say that um, um, at Christine Lake here, we are developing the first community venture capital corporation in BC. And uh, here is our first investment, $25,000. <laughs> so we're pretty proud of being able to start looking at how we in this community, this tiny community here, can take up our, our cudgel and see what we can do to move forward, taking into note the kinds of issues that have been brought forward to us this evening. So when you go about developing your community, there are certain things you need to do. And I won't go into all of these sorts of things, but sometime if anybody's interested, we could go through them, because pretty well all of those pieces are required. To me, the most important part is the part in the middle, the heart that we need to be values driven. We need to really understand what our, driven, what our values are. We need to have guts so that we can overcome the difficulties we're going to face because all of us are implicated in the current economy. Uh, like I said, if we all walked home tonight, maybe we would be less implicated in the current economy. But if we have values, if we see what's coming down the pipe, 
then we need to really, really get going on figuring out what our values are and making sure that we can begin to think about how to implicate those values and put them into place. We also have to be very innovative. We need to be um, socially aware so that our economic aspects solve social issues at the same time. And then the bottom one there is sweat equity. We gotta sweat. We gotta be doing stuff. We gotta make things happen. Starting all these projects I've talked about and all many, many more I could talk about all start with some people who sweat for quite a while to get the whole thing going. So that those things are important pieces I want to bring to your attention. So for me, I'm interested in imagining how we can have a climate resilient boundary. And um, I'm wondering, you know, are we ready here? Are we ready to move ahead? Are we ready to take charge of our future? And can we do this by grabbing hold of our economy? Thank you. Thank you so much. So much food for thought in there. Um, my gears are really turning. Um, and I know we're, we're just a few minutes behind our schedule. And I wanted to take a pulse a little bit about questions and interest here. There's two ways of dealing with this. One is to have a whole bunch of you know, 20 minutes of Q&A right now, which we originally had. Or the other is to move into some group discussion about some of these opportunities and if you've got burning questions, we've got stickies at all the table where if there's something you'd like to address directly from one of our uh, from one of our panel or openly at the end, we can address it. So knowing that you have that opportunity, are there any questions that you'd like to address first to the overall group uh, or of, of panelists before we move into this discussion? So it was like a shorter, shorter discussion period or a shorter question period before we move into our discussion. Any, any kind of overall questions that you wouldn't want to address on a sticky? Question for Ryan. How did that gas spill or that fuel spill impact the area you were working with? <laughs> I knew that came up. Um, short answer, I don't really know yet. Okay. The media effects have largely dissipated. I was up there on Monday, not far from the site, and you wouldn't even know it was there. Um, we said a bunch of fish counts done a couple weeks ago, and the fish populations aren't significantly different than they normally are. So the acute effects don't seem to be too horrible, but really we need some long-term monitoring data to see what really happened and where it's going to happen. So how do you see the value of the work that you've done in the past then in supporting the community and informing the community on, on being able to effectively assess what the impact is? We are really lucky in that area that they actually, through all the stewardship groups, is they have a lot of data. They have over 15 years of annual fish counts by the same persons. They actually have really good details of what fish populations were there and where they are. And they have over a decade of um, benthic and vertebrate plant counts, so all the bugs that fish eat. So they have a lot of really good base data there to have a baseline to know. Yeah. If we didn't have that, it would be really difficult for me. Can everybody work. at the end of the table hear that? No. no? That's what I was afraid of. Okay. <laughs> um, to answer Kathy's questions about how does the, the work that's been done in the area help assess the changes over time, I guess, the spill, is that we're quite fortunate in the Slow Cannon River, there's been a lot of committed, committed, committed individuals that have done a lot of work in there. Particularly, there's a fish biologist who's done annual fish counts in the same methodology in the same places for the better part of 15 years. So he has amazing data, literally, of every single rainbow trout in that river from they're pretty much the Silicon River to the Kootenai River, so he knows what's there. So you have phenomenal baseline data that they actually use to compare against the future similar accounts, so yes, and this has changed over time. So again, that baseline data really helps in case of diet. That's it? Yeah, it speaks to the importance of having good data because you don't know what's going to happen in yeah. the future. It's the last thing and we ever And you expect. aren't able to assess what the impacts are unless you put the work in to do those assessments. And the alternative would have been a spill up there of that 35,000 meters and having them do monitoring afterwards and going, oh, there's still fish, it's all good. But in reality now we have some way to check against that and say, no, these are the baseline levels in 15 years, you know exactly what should be here, and it has changed or it hasn't changed. And that's, a, that's a great segue to one of our opportunities. Are there any other overall questions that you wouldn't want to address on Sticky? In any event, they'll be answered tonight and openly if we have time for it. Okay, now, so what we have collected here are a set of 
um, opportunities. And I put down the keywords for the opportunities. I'd quickly go through them. And I'd also like to hear back about any that have come up to you tonight about, hey, we should, we should really do this to improve our resilience and, and deal with climate change. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to go through some of the opportunities. And then what's going to happen is um, we're basically going to have you go to a spot that you're interested in on one of these walls, and there's going to be a bit of discussion task about that opportunity. So I'm just going to walk through an example and then read through here if there's any others. So we'll just take Rolex crop diversification example. It will go right up here in the top on uh, this slide so you can see. It'll go right up here at the top. You're going to write all the factors that might help support that happening and are in favor of it. So forces, this is a force field analysis, forces that will support getting more diverse in our crops. And on the other side, what's happening that would actually hinder that? What barriers would we have to overcome? Constraints, those are the things against. Brainstorm, you know, what's for it, what's against it, and then what you can do is actually add up the total score for each side and at the end of the half hour or so, um, be prepared. One of you is going to speak very, very briefly, four sentences, what our topic is, what was the top scoring for and total score. So what's, what's the biggest thing for this? What's the biggest thing against this? And what do you think the next step is? So this is where we get to think forward. What are we going to do next on each of these items? Mark, can we write them on the top? Sorry, yes, that's one other item. So each of these, after you brainstorm, after you brainstorm, you go, you know, here's this number, here's this four. We could throw a bunch of seeds around in little seed balls and diversify our crops. Maybe you think that's really, really important, so you give it a five. Maybe your group decides it's actually only a one. <coughs> so maybe the biggest factor against might be education, it might be, you know, you can hire technical tools. You think of what you want to do uh, or what, what, what the constraints are against it and go forward with that. So, um, clears mud. We'll try it out with some questions. I'm going to go through what some of these topics are, and then the next thing that will happen is you'll individually go to the spot that Mark takes it to. If you've got an additional one, let me know. So I'm going to go through it all first. You can help me with that one. Great. So, some of the system, systemic stuff linking co ops together, linked co op development, uh, enabling policy from food system planning. Um, some other some other ones that uh, I come. I think this one doesn't belong up there. Some local food policy, desmogging the public square, um, and uh, member and community investment in um, you know our capital funds. That's a few things that are together in that kind of area. Um, in forestry and ecosystem ecosystem inventory and conserving and restoring our ecological assets. Um, Decreasing the interface fire risk with the harvesting example that Greg gave us about, um, you know, the fuel, the fuel to school program, um, using wood to replace, replace fossil fuels, maybe taking some of those interface loads. Um, increased grassland habitat and rangeland. I was talking to a rancher about this discussion last week, and he was like, "Sounds good to me." <laughs> you know, so there may be our economic opportunities that can also build carbon in the soil through how we manage grasslands. So if you'd like to talk about that, that's a topic. Are there any that I've kind of missed here overall? Uh, on water, we've got efficient irrigation and crop alternatives. We talked a little bit about that with Rolly as well. Um, water capture, storage, and reuse. Grey water, for instance. Um, community planning to protect uh, riparian and streamside areas and identifying and, and getting out of flood hazard and geomorphic hazard areas. So those are some of the topics that were brought up by, by our promoters. Are there any other ideas that you think that we could try out in your in, in the small group discussion that we go to board on? Any any burning ideas in here? Also a hundred mile initiative. Hundred mile initiative. Okay, so a local food promotion local initiative. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of a seal, the recognition, a boundary project. Okay. 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 How to reverse the trend of um, what's happened in the last 70, 80 years? Because you, you take that picture, you've you got the Granby 80 years ago, there used to be lots of little farms, 
that do everything. Potatoes, garlic, uh, all sorts of stuff. And now they're all hay. How do you reverse that trend when when they've all gone out of out of the business because it's the cheap products coming from all over the world, and that's what we're buying now because they're cheap. So how do we reverse that trend? That sounds that sounds great. It seems like it fits right in with a couple of the other topics. What what I might do if there's a lot of interest that's on linked topic, we might put two together in one place and and group can get around that. Okay. Are there any any other final ones? Okay. One that's always troubled me when we talk about food safety, food diversification, co-ops, etc., is where do we find the expertise in primary production and marketing? In the old days when I grew up here, there was a government agrologist that you could go to and get advice on this or that. All these diversified farms you just mentioned. Now there's no one. So where do we go to get the expertise that's being lost? And who do we trust? Whose opinion do we trust? Today? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Actually, Rolly, you you you've discussed before the need about local expertise and extension as being a part of how this that works. Is that kind of actually having locally supported agricultural extension to help make these things happen? Is that yeah, opportunity. Actually, that's that's yeah. Okay. No, it, it very much is right, but yeah. but it needs to have some. Um, some inertia behind it as well. Okay. Great. All right. So um, what's going to happen now is oh, there's, there's there's a lot of there's more of these than there are of these. So we're going to cluster them I think a little bit. Um, Mark, would you like to suggest a uh, first cluster and sending some people over over here? Yeah, I'm wondering maybe we could just call one out and see what the show of hands are. Yeah. If there's enough people to form a group, then we'll make a group and we'll go there. If not, there's only a couple people, then we'll move on until we get enough people and we'll And then we'll have about half an hour for the discussion after that. Okay. So then a group of people gather around and we'll do that as a group. And then we'll come back together. Each group will present a little four sentence report. And that's in the middle of each poster to remind you what that report's going to be when one of, one of your members comes up. And comes down. So, well, let's start with this one. I happen to pull it first. So, yeah. So, reversing the small farm farms turn to hate. How do we have robust local lots of food production happening? Robust and perhaps diverse. Okay. So, what are the hands up? Show us the hands on this one. Are there three, four, five? There's Perfect. probably five people. You want to go right there? Do we only go to one? There is only one that you can go to, but. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get them all first. Okay, why don't we get people maybe starting over here? Everyone that put up their hands and is interested, just come on over. Okay, and then the. Well, they're starting to move with this. The uh, second cluster and the uh, connected right here because Ryan's talk. They're breaking up into groups. Getting into that, which was the same as you already asked. Um, oh, I should, I should say, the probably the first that are related to the topic that you're addressing can can go over and help out that group if you have any questions. We'll rotate the a little bit and support the discussion. 